Hello and welcome to the debate. I'm your host Sanam Akbul with you at BTV World. In today's show, we will be talking about two important stories. The first is with reference to what is going on in the political situation of the country with regards to difficulties that seem to be increasing for the PTI's leadership. And then, of course, we've seen political temperatures rising on both sides while the economy, of course, is suffering. Uh, we have seen that there has been a lot of uh, confusion, a lot of debate regarding the case of Shabazz Gil, a PTI leader who earlier made controversial remarks marks at a television news channel uh, after which an fire was launched and he was arrested there was a two-day physical remand which was again extended uh, for two days and then uh, due to his condition he was uh, shifted to a hospital in Islamabad as well of course there have been reports of torture coming out as well and there's been a lot of blame game going on in terms of who's responsible for that and who's accountable along with the fact that investigation uh, seems to be something that is necessary according to the authorities and that they still need to get more information out of Shabazz Gil. Uh, what exactly is the kind of information that is required? What are the kind of questions that are being asked is also surfacing. So we will try and explore that in further detail as well and see where this case is going and then the kind of impact this is going to have on the overall political situation of the country, particularly with reference to the PTI's leadership and then of course the way the government wants to proceed with things uh, since of course uh, at the same time while all of this is happening, there are also demands are being put out for the disqualification of PTI chairman and the former former Prime Minister Imran Khan uh, with regards to the prohibited funding case and the Tosha Khana reference case in which uh, the ECP uh, is all set to start the proceedings of this particular reference uh, which is going to be heard by ECP's full court presided over by the Chief Election Commissioner as well and we will be uh, taking a look at the proceedings as well and see how this is going to of course uh, take a course uh, and then uh, when are we going to be uh, expecting uh, a verdict out of that and what is the way that things is going, that things are going to evolve, and uh, the future direction is going to take place, and how much uh, of uh, this particular threat of being disqualified hangs over the uh, the PTI chairman. So that's going to be our first segment of the show today. Our next segment is going to be regarding the government's a decision of lifting ban on non-essential and luxury imported items, something that has been announced earlier uh, by the uh, Federal Minister for Finance, uh, Mr. Miftah Ismail, and this is something that is coming in after three months of this restriction being imposed. Uh, why is this decision being taken? Uh, what sort of factors are being taken into account and how this is going to impact the economy are some of the things that we're going to be discussing. Of course, uh, Mr. Miftah Ismail has pointed out how this is an international requirement and uh, meanwhile while uh, this ban is lifted there is going to be increase of uh, heavy regulatory duties on these imports which is not going to impact uh, the increase of imports in the country which is what needs to be contained and controlled and so that purpose remains the same but how it's going to be done uh, seems to be uh, falling uh, from a different strategy now and how well this strategy is going to work in the coming days and months and who all is it going to impact is going to be our of course focus of the second segment today. For this and more as always I've been joined in the studios by Farooq Patafi and Raja Faisal and for our first segment regarding the political situation of the country we've been joined by Dr. Niaz Murtaza who's a political analyst and also Mr. Devan Sachal who's an MBA Sindh. Uh, thank you very much gentlemen for being with us and being a part of the debate. I'll start with you Dr. Niaz um, a look at the political situation of course um, uh, will of course tell anyone who is uh, witnessing what has been going on since the uh, start of this year that there is a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot of political blame um, and a lot of political games that have been uh, played. Uh, there have been a lot of institutions that have been targeted, a lot of personalities that have been targeted, many controversial remarks that have been made, not just Shabazz Gil but other as well. Um, and now we've seen of course a behavior uh, uh, which uh, is not uh, well suited to the authorities or well suited to the people responsible uh, in terms of investigating or providing justice as well also being carried out in the name of investigation whether or not all that is required or is actually benefiting of course remains to be seen but when we look at all of this it seems that perhaps we're moving farther away from a political situation where we can actually hope to uh, see uh, the political and economic situation of the country stabilize but in fact what we're seeing now uh, is more rifts uh, more polarization and um, a sort of uh, game that is being played in which each party wants to uh, do better or worse depending on how you want to look at it when we take a look at uh, Shabazz Gill's case and the way that it is being handled at the moment um, how do you see 
the current scenario uh, of the BTI leader, his condition uh, and the way that uh, uh, the accountability is being shifted on both sides? Well, uh, unfortunately, you know, the political situation is not showing any signs of stabilizing. Uh, luckily, on the economic side, things are improving uh, quite a bit with, you know, the rupee uh, recovering and, you know, the stock exchange recovering. Of course, the underlying problems are still there. But on the parallel side, the other side, the political situation is becoming more and more complicated. And especially the Shehbaz Gill case with, you know, new twists and turns in terms of, you know, uh, jurisdiction, the standoff between uh, the Islamabad police and the Punjab police, then, you know, the charges uh, regarding uh, the uh, torture uh, while he was uh, in uh, physical remand. So, uh, you know, it's still very unclear. Things are very fluid. From what uh, we can see, uh, you know, what has come out from the PIMS report, he is facing some medical problems. They may not be life-threatening, but certainly, you know, in terms of, you know, his asthma situation, uh, that seems to have deteriorated. So I believe he's still in hospital at PIMS and, you know, the doctors are looking at it. And once that's done, uh, then the next issue will be the handover uh, to the uh, Islamabad police for the physical remand. So, uh, you know, a lot of issues have come up, whether, you know, the charges against him are valid or not. Personally, I feel they are not. You know, what he said was, you know, uh, you know, he made a verbal statement, which is actually in line with even what the law says. If you look at the Azhar Khan case, the judgment clearly says that, you know, officers, even in the army, are not supposed to follow illegal commands and this is all he said he did not say that you know you should not follow any commands he did not approach individual officers so personally in my opinion uh, it's not a very strong case and then right. it's becoming uh, Dr. Sahab, that, uh, that point is made but regarding the optics of it uh, uh, while we understand that the man is going through uh, whatever he is going through uh, but these optics who do, who do they actually benefit at this moment uh, do they benefit the incumbent government or the opposition? Well, no, I think they benefit the opposition. You know, if you see all the images of him being dragged, of him being on a stretcher uh, in, in hospital. So obviously, you know, everybody feels and then, you know, there are the charges of, uh, you know, torture. And then if you look at the PIMS report, it does mention, you know, some tender marks. Now, what produce those tender markets too early to save. So I can't see how all this is, you know, benefiting the government at all. It's certainly, you know, uh, raising sympathy, uh, not just within, uh, you know, PTI circles, but even beyond uh, PTI circles, neutral people, and even people who are slightly put off by, you know, the way uh, the PTI itself had ruled during its three and a half years, did similar things. So, I, you know, the case itself and then the way things are spa uh, panning out, I think it's not a pretty sight. And, you know, it just brings into the fact that, you know, Pakistani justice system uh, goes to from one extreme to the other. What was happening to PMLN is now happening to PTI. And we can't find to, uh, seem to find, you know, the middle ground where things go according to the rule of law. Exactly. Dr. Murtaza, Dr. Murtaza, if we, uh, you know, look at this particular case of, uh, obviously, Shabazz Gill, uh, do you see a clear divide within PTI uh, on this context? Because if we see the, on, the, on the social media, of course, uh, there are voices, voices within PTI who are speaking against the leadership of uh, not sort of, uh, you know, uh, helping him out at this time or standing with him. And at the same time, we saw a few of the statements coming out from the uh, top tier leadership of PTI. Of course, they were not, uh, you know, in favor of uh, the statements made by Shabazz Gill. So do you see a clear divide within it? Well, yeah, I mean, certainly, uh, you know, some of the top leaders, for example, you know, there's a clip of Faisal Javed. Uh, I think it's in the Senate saying that, you know, the statement was wrong and, you know, he should be tried and so on. So it's a very, uh, you know, complicated situation. PTI also seems unclear in terms of how to handle it. You know, there is one segment of it, uh, which is, you know, led by some uh, saner elements within PTI and other people like 
Parvez Ilahi uh, pushing a PTI top leadership to you know try to you know uh, mend uh, its fences uh, with the establishment. But then you uh, see you know other forces, including uh, Imran Khan himself. You know he made another speech. I think it was today or yesterday. Uh, again, you know, exhorting uh, the neutrals to, you know, change its way. So I think there's a lot of flux and confusion even within the PTI. And in terms of, you know, the formal case, if it goes ahead, then these kind of statements are not going to be very helpful for Mr. Shehbaz Gill. Right. All right. Uh, let me go to uh, Mr. Devan Sachal also who's joined us on <coughs> telephone line. Mr. Devan, can you hear me? Mr. Mr. Devan, are you with us? Yes, I can hear you very clearly. Right. Uh, Mr. Devan, uh, when we look at the uh, situation uh, and the political uh, situation of the country, uh, and particularly with reference to Mr. Shabazz Gil's case, uh, Dr. Niaz earlier was saying that perhaps the kind of statements that he has made at the television channel uh, do not warrant such a case or such a response uh, that or such a treatment that is being given to him at this moment. How much do you agree with that? And then when we look at this particular case, do you really think that this is something uh, that is being used or can be uh, used uh, to target the PTI leadership, including the PTI chairman? Good evening to everyone and assalamu alaikum. Uh, Hi, yes, I could hear Mr. Niaz, and I think Mr. Niaz was right in one sense that the PTI leadership is totally confused right now. One person is saying one thing, another person is saying another thing. There's actually, I think there's a lot of uh, confusion on which line to take. They can't be very hard on Mr. Gill, obviously, because when Mr. Gill was doing all these, uh, uh, I mean, I don't want to use the wrong word, but in the sense when he was making all these ridiculous statements for the last couple of years, he was targeting everyone, whether it was people from the opposition, people from the media. He was using language which I would not dare use in front of my wife. So the point is, that was the time when Mr. Gill could have been censored. Not by the media, obviously, I mean by the PTI chairman. He could have told Mr. Gill at that time that this is not on. You need to take it back, take it back a notch. Like Mr. Chaudhary or Mr. Asad Omar, when they speak, they also obviously target everyone, but they don't go there. They have a line where they draw the, they know where to stop. Mr. Gill was moving at a speed which was very difficult to fathom. I mean, he's not a very, obviously, he's not a very old PTI member. I've been in PTI since 2012. Mr. Gill obviously joined PTI well after the government was formed. So, mm. I don't know whether he was playing on somebody else's agenda or whether he was yeah. right. like but that. Mr. Devan, I really my, my question was whether or not you think that uh, what he did uh, warrants the case that is uh, being uh, taken a, a look at at the moment and the kind of behavior and treatment and reports that we're hearing. No, I don't and think we, they're going to target the is chairman it or because Can of it be used against the PTI chairman as well? No, I personally don't feel they need to use anything against the PTI chairman on as far as this is concerned. I don't think this will happen. If they want to target the PTI chairman, they will either do it through the election, the the, for, the foreign funding case, or they are going to do it through the Toshra case. All right, but, but there are, they are reports going to use coming Mr. in that Gil the questions that. that are being asked uh, from Shabazz Gil um, are very much in relation to uh, the PTI chairman and um, also perhaps not really related to this particular case or just his own well, character taking Mr. is Gil's what the reports it, which are saying. I hesitate to take. I don't know whether Mr. Gill is speaking the 100% truth. This is what right. he's claiming. Yeah, 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 such a, a, a little bit of counterpoint. Sir, a little bit of counterpoint. Today, Imran Khan has actually made a very interesting statement. He said that uh, the neutrals uh, should actually mend fences uh, as long as they have got time. Uh, you understand him per, uh, personally as well. Uh, d uh, could you actually explain to us what he might have meant? What kind of time is he talking about? I don't actually understand what Mr. Khan was referring to. I'm being honest with you. I mean, he, it, I mean, there are a couple of double meanings in that, if you understand. I mean, if you remember one of the statements that Mr. Gill gave in court on day one or when somebody from the media asked him, he said, no, I wasn't targeting the army, I was only talking about the police. So they use these kinds of terms so that they can obviously wriggle out if it comes back to haunt them. Diwan Saab, yesterday there was a tweet from a minister of Punjab. Uh, I'm talking about uh, Colonel uh, retired Hashim Doga. He said in that tweet that... Uh, 
you know, obviously he was to tortured, uh, Gill was tortured, but uh, he was uh, obviously recovering from it. But as soon as he heard about that he is being handed over again to the Islamabad police, his uh, situation or his health deteriorated. And once again, uh, it went uh, very bad. Uh, his health went very bad. What do you grab out of it? Where was he tortured? Was he tortured uh, at uh, the hands of uh, Punjab police or uh, the Islamabad police? When you say, when you use the word torture, the torture can be more mentally than physically also. Mm -hmm. And I think this would have happened while he was in the custody of the Islamabad, Islamabad police. Uh, obviously, Adiala jail falls under the purview of the jail minister of Punjab and Mr. Parvez Ilai, the CM of Punjab. I don't think they would dare to torture Mr. Gill while he was in their custody. It doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Mr. Parvez Ilai has spoken out against Mr. Gill, disassociating himself, obviously, from the remarks that Mr. Gill made. But I don't think he would dare torture him. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't compute. Right, all right. Uh, Dr. Niaz, I want to understand two things from you. First, uh, with reference to what is being discussed in terms of uh, whether or not uh, uh, we're going to be taking a look at the kind of conditions that uh, Mr. Shabazzgil is now or is being treated as torture. Uh, when we take a look at what this means and the kind of statements that are coming in regarding how physical remand is necessary for investigation and the police needs more time uh, with Mr. Shabazz Gil, um, where do we draw the line and what sort of legal uh, um, aspects exist uh, to protect people from such uh, uh, conditions and behavior and be what uh, Mr. Uh, 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 Divan was talking about in terms of the way that uh, statements have been made in the past as well and perhaps not just by Shabazz Gil but other uh, leadership as well not just from PTI but other political parties as well it seems that perhaps the kind of moral or decent standards that we have keep on deteriorating and it seems okay to say a lot of this a lot of things and it's only just when certain lines are crossed uh, that there's a lot of fuss but prior to that uh, there is no accountability for the way political <coughs> leaders speak about each other yeah well, I mean, you know, it's a bit speculative unless there's a proper inquiry. It's very hard to say. But I think uh, would be to assume that if any torture has happened, it would have happened uh, uh, during the first two day when he was uh, in uh, physical remand with the Islamabad police. But then the question is, he was handed over to, you know, the Punjab uh, police uh, after that, which obviously is more sympathetic to him because, you know, it's an allied uh, government. So in the two or three days when he was with the Punjab police, why did they not, you know, do a proper medical investigation and collect proper evidence to show uh, that he was tortured? Uh, now, uh, the uh, uh, medical report from PIMS uh, does show some tender remarks. Why did they happen? Uh, now, the Islamabad uh, High Court has ordered, uh, you know, an initial report from the Islamabad police, and maybe they will order a judicial inquiry, and that will really, you know, uh, set uh, the record straight. Uh, in terms of, you know, uh, making sure that these things don't happen, there is this issue that, you know, physical remands are, you know, quite dangerous because, you know, the person in, uh, is in the hands of, you know, the investigative team with no proper checks and balances in jail. At least there is some check and balances. But uh, in uh, a physical remand, you know, uh, he's uh, the person is in the hands of the investigative team, which has a motivation to get things out of the person. So we need to make sure that, you know, these physical remands are kept to a minimum. Lawyers and families and friends have... Uh, access to the person and then the whole situation how long do you want to keep a person in jail uh, during trial this is the issue that had come up with uh, nab there you know it was months and years that people were kept in jail that has still not happened uh, under this regime uh, it's still like a week or, or 10 days but then even that uh, you know like we can see in this case gives a lot of opportunity for wrong things to happen right. so we uh, really Dr. need Zab, to... uh, when you're talking about uh, nab uh, arrest uh, uh, you are perhaps talking about the kind of torture that Devan Sahib was talking about, the mental torture. But, uh, but you know, this corporal f punishment, uh, physical torture, if it is uh, indeed uh, there was something of the sort, uh, do you think that there is any comparison between what went on in NAB and what is going on here? 
Well, NAV cases were different, but you know, like I think there were some charges made even by Rana Sanaula when he was, you know, in the custody of uh, the drug police and so on. But I, I am not a, yeah, that was FIA or the drug. Uh, you know, there's another department yeah, for that. Yeah. 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 So, uh, but in any case, you know, I'm talking about you know prolonged incarceration even before you've been convicted. Uh, and uh, that's why, you know, physical remand in such cases should be kept to a minimum. Now, obviously, you know, the court has decided to, you know, resend him back, which is also very unusual. Usually it's at the beginning and then you go into, you know, a judicial uh, custody. So there's a lot of issues and I hope the sooner this ends, uh, the better it will be. And then, you know, the real trial will start. And from what I can see, you know, the government still doesn't have a very strong case. They haven't been able to find his uh, cell phone. They haven't been able to get any, you know, confession from him. Even if he makes a confession in physical remand, he can always retract it later. So in terms of, you know, going beyond him and trying to pin higher leaders like Imran Khan himself, I don't think the uh, the government still has a right, very yeah. strong Dr. case. Dr. Murtza, if we look at this particular case, uh, obviously, it has gone uh, viral on social media as well, and international media is following it as well. Uh, to you, obviously, you're a uh, political analyst. Just wanted to know from you how uh, damaging it can be for Pakistan on an international arena. Yes, I think internationally, these kind of things are very damaging. And, you know, we've suffered a lot even in the last four years. We've fallen on so many like media freedom index, this index, that index. You know, generally human rights agencies have, you know, really uh, gone after Pakistan. And then it goes linked to, you know, the European Union GSP plus uh, deal and all which is also due for renewal next year so that is why it's extra important given that you know the pmln government had suffered similar things not necessarily torture but long incarceration the uh, crackdown on media and so on it should be a doubly uh, 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 you know, uh, make sure that these right, kind of absolutely. things... Absolutely. Um, when we look at this particular case, of course, it's not the only one that's going on uh, in terms of what's happening with PTI. Uh, Farooq, at the same time, we, of course, know that the Tosha Khanna reference has also been filed, and there's, of course, a prohibited funding case as well. And now the ECP's uh, full court is all set to hear the Tosha Khanna reference, and we're uh, expecting to see the results announced um, soon. Um, so when we take a look at this uh, particular issue uh, with reference to the kind of difficulties that are already existing for the PTI leadership, um, at the same time, the kind of behavior and treatment that is given to Mr. Shabazz Gill, um, which side do you think is really in a more difficult position at the moment? Uh, right, uh, Sarah, uh, from this I uh, take it that I can also comment on Shabazz Gill's uh, case yeah, as of well. Uh, otherwise, I thought that perhaps you have changed the question and now I will struggle with a new one. Uh, but, uh, it's the only question I ask. No, <laughs> no but uh, let us first talk about Shabazz Gil because that is something very important. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, look, uh, whatever is happening, whatever physical kind of nature of torture, it doesn't, uh, you know, uh, take away the fact that some laws were broken and there is a case against a man, right? Uh, but uh, somebody uh, I was sitting with today said something very insightful that uh, the police was asked to make an example of the man, they ended up making an example of themselves uh, by actually bringing so much controversy to the, themselves, right? So that is one other aspect which is deplorable, which should not be encouraged. But uh, to uh, 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 talk uh, uh, to a point that was raised by Faisal uh, earlier, you know, the problem with the people who have actually understood or perhaps who are actually a little bit privileged uh, this might be a shocker that something of this sort has happened, right? Uh, but for a country like Pakistan, where the system has been struggling for quite some time to find its feet, this kind of malpractices within the police confinement do take place, right? And that's why Pakistan has been facing a lot of uh, challenges in the past as well. Uh, but uh, regarding Shabazz Gil, finally, let me conclude by saying that uh, the only best way is first uh, to find out whether there was any physical torture or not because the constitution of Pakistan does not allow no. this, right? On the other side, that doesn't mean that it becomes a battle of narratives and you forget what was said 
and whether a law was broken. So there will have to be an investigation on that as well. And the only thing is, please don't get carried away, right, to all law enforcement agencies. Regarding Tosha Khana case, uh, uh, I think that at this moment, uh, agrees are uh, uh, in a way suggesting that perhaps things are going to go against me, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Imran Khan. And uh, frankly, today's statement also indicates the kind of paranoia he, he might be facing that uh, either uh, he will suffer or the entire country will. I don't think either is going to be that a clear uh, thing. Uh, there might be some kind of uh, initial ban or disqualification for the running uh, in the election, but I don't think in the longer term it is going to damage him. I don't think there is any existential threat to the system or the country. So Imran Khan Saab's uh, point of view might be exaggerated as well. At this moment, what we are seeing in Tosha Khana case is a simple question. Why, why were certain items not declared? Hmm. And that is a serious question. One should be answering that. Yesterday, I made it. Uh, I made made a point about it. That if you think that uh, you can fight narrative with narrative, not with evidence, that won't work in the long run. Mm -hmm. All right, um, Mr. Divan. Uh, when we take a look at the Tosha Khana reference, um, of course, uh, there are certain aspects to it, uh, which uh, the uh, PMLN and uh, the political parties and the government have been. Uh, talking about in terms of how this is foundation or base enough for uh, the PTI chairman's disqualification and also in the context of the prohibited funding case uh, in which of course there are many other accounts that have been declared that have not been declared according to the ECP and of course the kind of certificates that have been submitted by uh, Imran Khan as well earlier uh, do not really reconcile with what the evidence seems <coughs> to be coming out. So when we look at this uh, context uh, how much of a guarantee or an understanding Understanding do you have in terms of what is bound to happen now or how it, this is going to take course? Is this evidence enough? Are these facts or uh, this non-disclosure enough uh, to lead to his disqualification? And how exactly will his popularity uh, factor in this particular direction? Uh, I'm not a lawyer, so obviously I'm not do I, I'm not, nor have I seen, uh, seen many documents on this. I've heard what the analysts are saying. I've obviously heard what the filing petition on the Tosha Khana case, Mr. Moshin Shah Nawaz Ranja, has said. But uh, do the documents prove all that? I really don't know. What I personally think this might, might be a long game that they might be playing a game that, okay, let's uh, disqualify Mr. Khan and let it go to the appeals court. Obviously, if they do disqualify him, he's going to appeal. There's no way. Uh, the, it's not the Supreme Court. The case is not being handled by the Supreme Court right now. Uh, on the Tosha Khanna case, it's the High Court larger bench. And on the Election Commission case, it's still the Election Commission, which is asking questions. So I personally feel there's a lot of margin there yet. So they might do something and then... There might be a backdoor deal in Parliament that, okay, let's uh, uh, not uh, disqualify anyone, including Mr. Sharif, who has already been disqualified, including Mr. Jangir Khan Tareem, who has already been disqualified. So it might be a long game. I think that's personally what I feel this is going. I don't All right, see it uh, uh, right, Dr. Niaz, how, uh, how much do you think that this might be true in terms of how the different political parties or leadership may reach to an understanding before we even see uh, these cases uh, come to their logical conclusion? And also, when we talk about the Tosha Khanna reference uh, in terms of, uh, of course, the non-disclosure of the assets, um, how do we uh, see this particular issue in terms of what has been said earlier uh, by the PTI's leadership and uh, their claims to credibility and honesty? Is that going to impact at all uh, the popularity and the narrative that has been given out by the PTI leadership? And Dr. Murtaza, if we look at the, you know, the outlook which is painted by uh, Divan Saab is that everything is moving towards the reconciliation. Do you see it like this? Well, you know, if you start uh, putting PTI against, you know, the high and mighty standards that PTI sets for its opponents, then obviously, you know, the whole of PTI should be disqualified a hundred times. But then obviously, you know, that's not the right way to look at it. Whatever PTI said in the uh, past, etc., that should be seen as politics. But what really matters is, you know, the rule of law, rationality, a sense of social justice. 
So if I look at you know this Toshahana case, from what I have read in the newspaper, there were some assets that he did not declare in the past year, but then you know later he did declare them. Uh, so from my point of view, as you know a common sense person, I would say let uh, bygones be bygones. If he has declared them ultimately, then you know why make a fuss out of it? But then you know. If you look at you know the minor uh, basis on which you know other leaders like uh, Nawaz Sharif were uh, you know disqualified and that too for a lifetime, then you know the precedent says something else. So let's see how it pans out. But personally, you know I am against uh, you know 62-1F anybody getting disqualified because it's right. a very uh, vague. Right, Doctor Niaz, uh, when we uh, look at the fact that the ECP's full court presided over by the Chief Election Commissioner is going to be hearing with Osha Khan at reference, of course he's somebody uh, that the PTI leadership including Imran Khan have talked against, talked about how there is uh, uh, there is no um, impartiality and then when we uh, talk about the fact that uh, the kind of decisions that have come earlier seem to be biased or they've accused him of not being uh, neutral so to speak. So how exactly do you think the PTI leadership uh, or the PTI chairman is going to go about this particular case? Are they going to go ahead with the proceedings as they are? Are they going to uh, value them or consider them as credible? Are they going to accept the results? Well, obviously, you know, anybody who starts investigating PTI, PTI starts, uh, you know, blaming them, accusing them of being biased. But obviously, we cannot go by that uh, thing. You know, I think PTI has actually benefited hugely by some wrong decisions of ECP that went in its favor, the Punjab government and the disqualification of 25 MPs. Uh, as the Supreme Court judgment has shown, you know, the letter of the party head was not enough. And that was the basis on which ECP disqualified those 25 people. So I don't agree that the ECP has been against uh, PTI. It's doing its job neutrally as far as I can see. But I'm sure PTI is not going to uh, accept it and then it might go into appeal and so on. And then you mentioned the point about, you know, the parties going back to uh, the parliament to try to fix this law. Uh, once uh, uh, if Mr. Imran Khan gets disqualified. But still, I think there'll be a difference uh, between what PMLN would want. PMLN would want a change where uh, the law is not scrapped, but, you know, uh, the period is only for five years because, you know, right. Nawaz Sharif has only served five years. Right. They wouldn't want it completely. So let's see what happens. But would, I personally... Right, uh, would Dr. Dr. Zab, uh, very, very humbly regarding uh, something that was said earlier about the back backdoor deals. Uh, one thing that troubles everybody, especially this crime, is that uh, we end up talking about things which are beyond the pale of reason or, uh, you know, one's experience. All these conspiracy theories and how things are actually going to be and they might end up benefiting A, B, C or D. Uh, but in the end, uh, facts are the actual losers. Is it not true that if Imran Khan Saab, when he was implying that perhaps by disqualifying him, uh, some kind of concession might be taken uh, for uh, Mian Nawaz Sharif, Imran Khan Saab should have come on record if he was contacted by somebody uh, with such a proposal to actually uh, bring up that uh, that evidence rather than just speculating in public is uh, do you think that this is moral leadership when one is actually basing the argument on speculation well you know that's the thing you know that's the way of pti speculation accusations without any uh, proof uh, so but you know the fact that it, the pmln doesn't really need the votes of pti all it's need to do is to you know make a law a subsidiary law about the length of the uh, period for which somebody gets to disqualified under 62.1f and that can be done by an act of parliament which doesn't require a two-thirds majority. Uh, they can simply make it five years and you know Nawaz Sharif's five years are already over. So I don't see there is a, a need for a deal between PTI and PML on this point. PML right. has um, Dr. Niaz, uh, since we're short on time, we're going to move on to our next segment, but I request you to please stay with us and join us for that discussion as well because we'll be talking about uh, the economic situation mm. of the country and of course uh, the government's announcement regarding lifting of the ban on the import of non-essential and luxury items 
item, something that the finance minister spoke about, saying that it's not going to impact or increase the imports, uh, but however, it is going to be in line with the international requirements. Um, how do you see this particular move in terms of the way uh, or in which sectors do you think it's going to impact uh, the country and whether or not the statement coming in saying that it won't result in an increase of imports because there will be heavy duties uh, that are going to be imposed uh, on these imports, uh, not really going to impact the increase in imports. So at the end of the day, uh, because of this ban, we will not be seeing an increase in imports? Well, you know, this ban was imposed, what, two or three months ago when, you know, the situation was very precarious. You know, the rupee was following, uh, falling like nine pins and it had gone up to 240. Now, of course, the situation is that it has recovered usually and it's down to, you know, 215. It might go down even further. People are saying 200, even below uh, uh, 200. And the thing is, uh, you know, there are international requirements as well, you know, Pakistan is part of, you know, the World Trade Organization and it has certain rules and regulations. And, you know, there is the issue that if you put, you know, a ban on the uh, imports from other countries, the other countries can also retaliate on what they import from you. So in many cases, you know, these bans don't work out very well. So, you know, I think putting higher duties, uh, especially now that, you know, the uh, a foreign uh, currency situation is going to, you know, improve once, you know, we get the money from IMF, which will be followed by, you know, more coming uh, money po coming in from World Bank, from Asian Development Bank, some of our allies. So I think uh, the situation on the foreign currency will improve, improve considerably. Right. And then, you uh, know, Dr. the Sir, first... Uh, Dr. Yeah, Sir, uh, you earlier said that usually such bans actually don't work. Uh, I understand uh, uh, this argument because I also believe that there shouldn't be, uh, you know, much intervention uh, in the market uh, forces, right? But uh, with due respect, uh, one thing that we keep on hearing fr uh, from the finance minister is that this time the ban actually worked and imports actually went down and the fact that uh, a dollar was basically hemorrhaging before that, it also actually stopped and that's why rupee has stabilized. Uh, while the uh, duty increasing duties might actually act in the same fashion, but uh, you will still think that a ban is uh, totally bad for the economy at this moment? Well, uh, you know, uh, because, you know, th there isn't very strong evidence that, you know, such kind of bans work. Uh, I understand there has been a huge fall in, you know, imports, but I think there were other reasons uh, responsible for that beyond you know the bans you know there have been also very strict uh, action taken by the state bank in terms of you know approving foreign uh, exchange for lc so uh, that has been really the main reason for you know imports going down then the other reason is that you know uh, the price of uh, you know uh, oil has also been going down considerably in international markets so i won't say that you know the fall in the imports is solely because of uh, you know, the bans on these uh, luxury items. Uh, it's because of a number of different reasons. So now that, you know, the situation is better, I think it's uh, the, the real thing that, you know, Pakistan needs to do is to, you know, make changes in our, you know, consumption patterns. So, you know, our big uh, imports are, of course, fuel. So we should, you know, move towards more fuel self-sufficiency in the way we import, consume fuel, for example, move towards more, you know, public transport, uh, go towards electric uh, cars. You know, then, you know, if you are using uh, oil in your, uh, you know, electricity uh, generation, then, you know, switch to, you know, uh, a solar to micro hydro projects. So I think there is a need to make those kind of changes because every time we face this current account balance and then, you know, the prices of fuel, oil are going up, uh, countries like Pakistan are uh, hit very, very badly. So we yeah. do need to, you know, get more uh, self-sufficiency in food and fuel. Right. Yeah. Dr. Mutaza, if we look at uh, obviously our domestic production, do you think that we need to improve our domestic production as well? Uh, because there are so many items which are being imported from outside of the country, uh, which can be made in Pakistan and we can consume it, obviously, as an alternate from within Pakistan. And that is causing trouble for, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, import export balance as well would you agree with this sir? Could, could, could you give an example also there are, there are there are so many examples no, no, no. chocolates okay. there are so many uh, examples about uh, uh, you know dog food cat food no have you have you compared the quality of the the one available here i'm a uh, pet father right same uh, the uh, the quality which is available locally and the well, one that is well that's important. what i'm saying we need to improve our domestic production no, if we but improve that will our happen domestic in the production. long run in the short uh, short run what are you going to do let the uh, pets die in the, in the shorter run of course we need to improve our uh, the quality of the How? products which we are making in pakistan short, short How? time that's oh. what that's what I wanted to ask from Dr. All Dr. right, Dr. Let's, let's take Dr. Niaz's input in this. <laughs> Dr. Zab. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there is, of course, you know, uh, a, a room for uh, import substitution. And that's why if you don't keep, you know, a fixed exchange rate, you let the markets determine it, that lead to two things. First of all, you know, your exports increase. And since imports have become more expensive, there is more room for uh, local producers to, you know, start making some of the things uh, that we, we were previously uh, importing. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of things, you know, it's not just a matter of, you know, uh, chocolates and things, you know, they look uh, bad on paper, but if you start looking at their values, uh, I don't know, you know, the figures that you, I see on uh, the state bank uh, uh, website, it doesn't really go into this nitty gritty of how much chocolates cost, how much pet foods cost. There is a larger, you know, uh, sub uh, section for food. Uh, where, you know, the biggest item, of course, is wheat. We've been, you know, importing a lot of wheat. So, you know, we should look at why we need to import wheat. We are an agricultural agrarian economy, huge tracts of land, water. Why do we have to, you know, really uh, import wheat? So, you know, we need to pr increase our productivity in no, agriculture. Uh, that is absolutely of... right, Dr. Saab. But let me pass uh, Faisal's question further because there is something important in there. Uh, you know, he's talking about two aspects of it. Uh, one, uh, the quality of value addition, hmm. and the other one is scalability. Do you think that both these things can be achieved within a short span of time, particularly uh, regarding not wheat, but value addition sub uh, substances or uh, commodities? Of course, everything uh, takes time. You can't do it overnight. You can't expect to, you know, put an immediate ban and then expect, you know, local production to increase. But, you know, there needs to be a proper planning. You know, we need to look at our import profile and decide which are the biggest consumers of dollar and, you know, which one of them is feasible to start producing locally. And then, you know, so for example, chocolate, you know, it depends, it's a dairy product and, you know, we have a huge livestock sector, which is, I think, the second biggest sector uh, in the economy. So, you know, why can't we produce chocolate, not uh, in the uh, short term, but maybe in the medium term, but go for the big ticket items, you know, uh, chocolate might look very fancy, but then what's its value? I haven't seen a figure for it. You know, a lot of economists yeah, talk about you're it, right. but, you're right. but, you're right. eat, obviously, but uh, 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 even uh, the there state. are other things like cars for that matter, yeah. we keep on importing them, right? Or then we assemble them in this country. But if you are going to ask the local uh, you know, uh, industry to come up with something local very quickly, they will take their sweet time to actually match the quality of the imported yeah. items. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Niaz Murtaza, for joining us and being a part of the debate and staying with us for our next segment as well. Uh, Farooq, your take on this particular decision and also the fact that uh, there are no restrictions on uh, importing machinery for uh, industries that are exporting, but there are restrictions uh, for importing machinery for those who are uh, producing products for the domestic market. How do you think that's going to impact our local industry? Right. Uh, one very interesting aspect of uh, the debate around eco economics is the quality or the value of exports, right? There are economists even now, uh, like Raghuram Rajan and others, very distinguished people who believe that the first job of any industry is to actually manufacture for the local consumers, right? Uh, but then, of course, we have to actually talk about foreign currency reserves, and that's why what you need is exports too. So uh, in that context, I can understand that uh, uh, it, since there is going to be some kind of uh, some value to the machinery or the Im inputs that you actually bring in that can actually exp uh, export. So they, that makes sense in the short term at least. In the long term, of course, 
you have to first ensure that your domestic uh, consumer is covered, as we were talking about, mm. right? Mm. Uh, but uh, regarding something else, Sana, it is very important. Every day, 50 odd channels are going after one man, and they keep on attacking him, and now the attacks have started coming from his own party. And I'm talking about Dr. Mifta Ismail, and I think that he is doing God's work right now, the way he's trying to stabilize the economy, and he is doing it for the greater good of the country. I think that the kind of salvos and the kind of attacks the, and the kind of pressures that we keep on witnessing uh, are really, really deplorable and I, I wish they could stop. Uh, right. There is a time for lobbying within parties or within governments for jobs, but this is not it. A person is to trying his level best to actually make sense of this total madness of economic chaos that was there. Right, so at this moment, it is important to bolster him by supporting that the CMD comes up. There. Absolutely, and we have all our hopes uh, lined up with him as well, and of course the government in terms of taking the country out of this economic crisis, and we hope that we're going to see better days soon. Uh, we have seen some sort of recovery, but we hope that it's long-lasting uh, and that we can move towards a change that is sustainable. That's all that we have for the debate. See you tomorrow.